Uh, welcome. Thanks very much for coming out for this evening. I know in this room tonight there'll be people who have got problems and got things that they're stressed about. My only request is this, that for the next hour or so, we make a little agreement with each other. This is the magic space of theatres all over the world, right? This is the agreement we make with each other, that for the next hour or so, we agree to have a bloody good laugh. Is that a deal? Yeah. Yes. We forget all those things, we'll leave them outside, and in here, we'll have a bloody good laugh together. That's what we're going to do with each other. And if you've got an embarrassing laugh, don't worry about it. You're all welcome here. You've got a high-pitched witchy laugh or a deep Barry White laugh, I'm fine with this. Maybe you've got a little pig laugh. Maybe you've got one of them. One of them. I love a pig laugh, guys. I love a pig laugh. That's when you know someone's just let it go, when all... <laughs> The only thing better than the pig laugh is the surprise pig laugh even you weren't expecting. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just love your faces. Shock! <laughs> the best laugh of all is the mum laugh. Where are mums? Give us a cheer, mums. There you are. The mum laugh is my favourite of laughs and hopefully you'll hear it throughout the evening. Very specific to mums. Only mums do it. Nobody knows why. It's a beautiful, natural phenomena. I'll do a joke. You'll hear a mum somewhere in the room very quietly, repeat the last couple of words that I said <laughs> to whoever they're with. Nobody knows why they do it. It's like one of the X-Files. <laughs> I'll do a joke. Let's say the punchline's jug of water. You'll just hear a mum somewhere in the room. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> jug of water. <laughs> Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Every time I do a new show, I always put pressure on myself. I go, right, Jace, let's get in shape for this one. I never specify the shape. I'm not a dickhead, do you know what I mean? But I... <laughs> I always put pressure on myself and go around and lose some weight. Before I did the last tour, I lost about a stone and a half in preparation for the tour. I thought, right, I'm going to lose a bit of weight and get into this. Thanks for the applause there. <laughs> and... No, I don't want it now. No, no. No, it's too late. It's sarcastic, if anything. If you've got to ask for an applause, it's patronising. You can stick it up your ass. I don't want it. I'm obsessed with trying to lose weight. I, I, I think about it every single day, obsessed with it. And the clues have been there that I was piling on the pounds. You know, clothes that used to fit me don't fit me anymore. I catch my reflection in the mirror from time to time. I remember one time I ran up the stairs naked, I got a round of applause, I was the only person in the house. <laughs> <laughs> the other way of finding out you piled a few pounds on is social media, they'll let you know. I reckon once a fortnight somebody tweets me to tell me that their plus net broadband has gone down. <laughs> that is a different guy! <laughs> Sometimes people come up to me in the street. Oh, mate, my pal is a spitting image of you. And then they bring this thing out of the pub. <laughs> I kid you not, he can't wait to meet me. <laughs> Me, no way. Sometimes I have to do selfies as you and everything. <laughs> oh, do you really? Cos your eyes aren't even level, pal. <laughs> what I've realised about losing weight, from everything I've read and looked into it, is that it's, it's up here, it's a problem up here. It's not greed, it's not, it's not here, it's in the brain. And as soon as I realised that, it sort of made a lot of sense to me. I, re I read a little book a while back, called Selfies, a book by a guy called Will Storr. Fascinating book. And in the book, he says that psychoanalysts and psychologists and counsellors all are in agreement that every one of us has got two selves in the brain. There's two people in your brain. And they're often conflicted, right? So you've got the ideal self, and your ideal self is a version of you, like a better version of you. A version of you that you feel if you could just get to, there's a level of happiness that you've not experienced yet. And as soon as I read it, it was like, poof, light bulb came on. I thought, of course that's what's going on. Every morning, when my willpower is at its strongest, the ideal version of me wakes up and makes plans. I go, right, Jace, today's the day. We're going to start being healthy. And straight away, this side is giving it, what? <laughs> on a Thursday. <laughs> Whoever started anything on a Thursday? <laughs> Look, let's just have a mad weekend and we'll start Monday, I swear, I swear. <laughs> but I persevere and go, no, I'm going to have a healthy breakfast, have poached eggs, I'm going to go for a 40-minute walk, I'm going to have a chicken salad later on, I'm going to join the gym and do a spin class, I'm going to have a healthy soup and a protein shake. That's the sort of thing healthy people do. And then 10 to midnight, repackage the Jaffa cakes in front of Netflix. Right? That is the two brains. 
conflicted. And look, it might not be weight loss with you, it could be absolutely anything, but there's even inventions out there to counteract the two people in your brain. Look at the snooze button on your alarm clock. Just think about that for a second. The snooze button on your alarm clock has been invented for one person. A person who made a definitive decision not eight hours earlier. <laughs> they looked at all the information, they assessed the situation, and they said, you know what, tomorrow, I'm getting up early. <laughs> getting up early, I'm gonna wind the kids' uniforms, gonna make a packed lunch, I'm gonna get into work and do some emails before people start bothering me. That's the sort of person I wanna be tomorrow. <laughs> and the next day, the same human being wakes up <laughs> surprised. Fuck that, I'm getting over this time. <laughs> you even say to yourself, what was I thinking? <laughs> you are your own worst enemy. <laughs> Who's got weighing scales in their bathroom? Yeah. Yes. Right. Now, I get on my scales every day. I don't know why. We have a weird relationship with weighing scales. I don't think I've ever met anybody who takes the first reading as fact. <laughs> <laughs> These things have been engineered to the nth degree by people at the top of the profession for generations, and yet nobody takes the first reading as fact. <laughs> nobody gets on a set of scales. Oh, is that me? Is it a crack on with my day? No. <laughs> just there, river dancing on the buses for 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> or dragging it elsewhere in the bathroom. Do you do that? I just need to find a friendly tile. <laughs> a fitness friend of mine said to me once, he said, don't just weigh yourself, measure yourself. So you get a tape measure and you measure your waist and your belly and your chest and your neck and you add these numbers up and hopefully all being well, if you've been living a healthy lifestyle, a few weeks time, you'll have lost some numbers. I thought, well, that's a good idea. I'll do that. So I got this, I was at my absolute biggest I'd ever been and I got a tape measure and I measured myself right here in the middle of the barrel. 122 centimetres, it read. Right, now, I'm guessing from your immediate overall reaction there, <laughs> you don't do metric. There's <laughs> a lot of blank faces looking at me there. 122 centimetres. I don't really know metric either. So I thought, right, I'll go on Google and I'll just convert it. Convert 122 centimetres. Fucking four foot. <laughs> Just let that sink in for a second. <laughs> I was four foot around the middle <laughs> of a human being. <laughs> for the people at the top there, I am six foot tall. I was four foot around the middle. <laughs> That's the measurements of an oblong, not a person. <laughs> six by four is a bloody fence panel where I come from. <laughs> it's a human being. Devastated is not the word. And Google's not your friend. <laughs> just wants to keep you online all day. Underneath the information, there was a little line and it just said, interesting things, that's a four foot. I thought, I don't want to know, Google. <laughs> but curiosity got the better of me. That side of my brain was like, click it, click it. <laughs> so I clicked on it. First example, Danny DeVito's four foot six. <laughs> like... <laughs> what a day I'm having! I woke up fine, I'm going to the bed with the knowledge of where Danny DeVito was a bloody belt. <laughs> In this book, it, it lists all the things that we often are conflicted about. Am I a good enough parent? Am I a good enough partner? Uh, am I a good enough friend, child, whatever it is. One of them in the top five is, am I kind enough? Am I a nice enough person? And I think generally most people are nice just by default, you know what I mean? I think most people are. It's harder and harder to work out whether you're a nice person anymore. Life will sometimes give you a kick in the ass, you know? I remember last year, my wife booked us a weekend in Venice. Absolutely beautiful, stunning. I mean, boring, but beautiful. <laughs> Venice, I mean. <laughs> and we were, hey, come on. Hey, you're better than that, come on. 
We were wandering through the Piazza San Marco, the center of Venice, uh, on all the postcards, hand in hand, having a lovely romantic time. There's thousands of years worth of architecture and artwork, and the sun is beaming down, and people are having a beautiful time. And I'm like a helpful bloke, annoyingly so. You know, if you need a help with a buggy up some steps, luggage down some steps, a lift door leaving open, I'm your guy, I'm always there. And I, as I'm walking through the center of Venice, I spot through the crowd, uh, an Indian family, about six or seven, and there's another Indian fella, and he's taking a picture in front of a beautiful bit of architecture. So I just see some people in need, so I have a little wander over. I said, excuse me, mate, excuse me. I said, do you want to take a picture of uh, all of you together? And he said, what? Quite rudely, and I was taken aback. I said, do you want to take a picture of you and your family all together? And he said, and I'll never forget it, he said, that's not my family. <laughs> He said, I was just walking past and he asked me to take a photo <laughs> for him. <laughs> I was like, how's this happened, eh? <laughs> I was trying to be nice and now I'm a racist. <laughs> In the end, I confessed it to my friend, Steve. I said, I need to get this off my chest. He said, oh, good. I'm glad you told me that, mate, because something happened to me recently. I've not been able to tell anybody. I said, well, tell me and then I'll tell it on. Telly. <laughs> so this is what happened to my mate Steve. Steve lives in South Manchester, a very multicultural area, the sort of place you can't get through the day without respecting people's viewpoints and beliefs in things. It's one of the things that makes it a special place to live. And he's gone to use a cash machine. And when he gets there, there is a man already using the cash machine. Six foot behind the man, so quite the distance, there is a woman waiting a turn. So Steve comes over, he's not exactly sure what's going on, because that's quite a distance for a queue. So he just says to the lady, excuse me, are you in the queue for the cash machine? And she answers very politely as well. She says, I am, yes. Uh, she says, I'm Nigerian, and my religious beliefs are that because I don't know this man and I'm unmarried and we're not related, this is the distance that I feel safe and respectful to what I believe in. So because Steve's a very thoughtful person, he then stands six <laughs> foot away <laughs> from her. <laughs> I mean, that's a 12-foot three-person queue out of nowhere. <laughs> Your man gets his money and he wanders off. The woman moves to the machine to do her money business. Steve then occupies the space that she was formerly in, still adhering to this six-foot rule. A couple of seconds pass and another man comes over. He doesn't know what's going on with this queuing system. So he says to Steve, excuse me, mate, you in the queue for the cash machine? And Steve goes to explain, but he is not loaded with all the information. <laughs> and these are the words that come out of his face. I am, yeah, but I'm standing here because she's Nigerian. <laughs> Even when you're trying to be nice, man. It's a bloody minefield out there. Every one of us in this room is generally politically correct by default. That's just being polite and being nice and not saying words that you think might upset somebody. But it's been ruined in the last 15 years or so by pricks on the right and knobheads on the left. <laughs> Uh, and when I say left and right, I don't mean us. <laughs> I don't mean us. We're, none of us in here are all the way on the right or all the way on the left, because those people do not come to comedy gigs. <laughs> because they ain't fun. <laughs> These minority of people, all the way on the left and all the way on the right, are the ones spoiling things for the rest of us just trying to get through life, upsetting as few people as possible. That's all we're trying to do. <laughs> you know? with ourselves, we're all a little bit in the middle. We're sometimes a bit left, we're sometimes a bit right, just depending on the issue and how it affects us. You know, you might be a bit lefty liberal. I feel like I'm a bit lefty liberal sometimes, you know, and I'll say things like, you know, I just think prisons should be used to rehabilitate prisoners so then one day they can give something back to society. <laughs> and then your house gets robbed and you're like, get hang them. <laughs> That's just being a human being, mate. I'm talking about the people all the way on the right giving it. They're coming over here, stealing our jobs, claiming our benefits. What, both of those things? <laughs> <laughs> and you've got the people all the way on the left, these bloody fun sponges. <laughs> Finding offence everywhere you go, even in humour. Knock, knock, what about homeless people? They've not got a door. <laughs> they get it. Let me tell you now, it's not a cool thing to say, but political correctness works. 
Sometimes you've got to make a decision. You've got to make a decision on which way you're going to go with political correctness, certainly when it reaches factual correctness. That's when I think, hang on a minute, where am I going to go here? And for me, I go with facts, because facts ain't changing, you know? For example, at my kids' primary school, they celebrate everything, all the international days of whatnot, pride and the festivals from all over the world. But their favourite day of the year is September the 19th, which I'm sure I don't need to tell you lot, is International Talk Like a Pirate Day. <laughs> It's a proper day. They dress up as little Jack Sparrows. It's 50p for a local charity. It's adorable. Now, I know you're itching to do it. So after three, I want your best pirate action, OK? One, two, three. <laughs> that is where your brain goes to when someone says do a pirate action. Of course it is. That is the most famous noise that a pirate makes. But my brain doesn't always work like everybody else's. And I love documentaries and I love stats and statistics. And so I know, for example, that approximately 83% of modern day pirates are actually from the west coast of Africa or Somalia. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it leaves me in a terrible quandary every September the 19th. <laughs> every 20th of September, I'm called into the head teacher's office. Because <laughs> my kids have just been wandering around school, just giving it shiver, my dimbers. I'm like, well, <laughs> that's, that's how pirates sound now. <laughs> They're just factually correct pirates, Smith. It's not my fault the world's moved on. I will make you walk the plank. Guys, guys, <laughs> you've made your point. This is for home, not for out. <laughs> if anything, your R is offensive to the people of Cornwall. They've moved on. <laughs> so now you know next time someone says do a pirate action, you can come straight back at them. Yo, ho, 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 and a bottle of rum. <laughs> that is how <laughs> modern-day pirate talks. I've done that joke for quite a while now on tour, and um, sometimes when I've tried to do it on telly, they've gone, oh, what if people complain? That presumes that I wouldn't care if somebody was upset or offended by something that I said. And genuinely, I, I would be. I I'm not one of those comics who likes to offend people. And don't get me wrong, I've got mates who do that, Jimmy Carr and Jim Jeffries and Frankie Boyle, and, you know, they get away with that sort of stuff because they don't have a soul, you know. Um, <laughs> they know where they're going at the end, and they've made peace with it, you know. But, uh, <laughs> But for me, you know, I've been doing that joke on tour. We spoke to over 400,000 people. Not once I've ever got to the end of a gig, got to stage door or a local bar, and there's been like a pirate there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just all upset, crying his eye out. <laughs> I think we're doing all right, you know. It's only common sense. I'm going to tell you something now that I'm deeply embarrassed about, but I feel like we're pals, so look. I do a lot of driving. That's not an excuse, but that's the reason. I do a lot of driving, and uh, a couple of years ago, I ended up doing a speed awareness course. <laughs> I know. No, you're right, you're right. It's a silly thing for me to have done. Uh, speed awareness courses. Give us a cheer if you've done one. <laughs> Weird thing about speed awareness courses, for the people who do not know about speed awareness courses, uh, there are 25 minutes of really interesting, important, life-saving advice, and that is spread over four hours. <laughs> now, I was lucky. I was lucky. I ended up sat next to a fella called Jeff. Jeff was from Glasgow. They don't have speed awareness courses in Scotland for whatever reason, and he'd sped up near Carlisle Way, and his nearest soonest course was Manchester. So down he came, and he was sat next to me. And it happens that he came down with his wife, and his wife went to spend the day at the Trafford Centre, the huge shopping centre on the outskirts of Manchester, and she went to spend the day there, and he was sat next to me. He was sort of mid-70s, and it became quickly apparent that he didn't realise the course was four hours long. <laughs> Because when he was given this information, he went white as a sheet. <laughs> I said, are you all right, mate? He said, I didn't know it was four hours long, pal. I said, yeah, four hours. He went, oh, no, 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 no! <laughs> I said, oh, what's wrong? He said, my wife's at the shopping centre. It'd have been cheaper to pay the fine. <laughs> oh, he was livid. Jeff became one of my favourite people, right? 25 minutes into the course, the guy leading the class says to us, when you're driving on an A road, road signs are green. When you're driving on a motorway, road signs are blue. And that's how you know the difference between those two very busy, very dangerous roads. Jeff piped up, nobody asked him to. 
He says, that's right, pal, and uh, if they're grey, that means you're going the wrong way. <laughs> I'll learn that the hard way, guys. <laughs> My favourite moment was at the end of the lesson. It's five o'clock, jackets are being put on, wallets, keys, phones being collected, put in pockets, and we're heading out the door single file. The guy stops Jeff just as he's leaving. Have you got to get back to Glasgow now, Jeff? He says, I mean, that's right. He said, what's that for Manchester? About four and a half hours. He said, I'll do it in two. He's <laughs> <laughs> not learned to love you, Dick. The two people in your brain, you know, the, the weird thing about the two people in the brain is that now I've sort of read about it, I feel a lot more normal knowing that everyone is struggling with the same things, the same conflict in your own brain, the two selves. One of the things that I struggle with most is where I fit just in the world, like in life itself, you know, I struggle with that a little bit. Because I'm from a very working class background. I was born in Salford. My grandparents were Irish immigrants. They came over from Dublin in the 50s and they were musicians and they played in the pubs and clubs of the Northwest. And they had 11 children and my mum was one of them. And I was actually born uh, a few weeks after my mum's 17th birthday. She had three of us by the age of 21, which obviously I realised by Salford standards is quite the late starter. <laughs> uh, but she, um, <laughs> I was brought up on a council estate. Anyone live or still live on a council estate? Yeah, yeah a few people. Council estates, you know, they get a bad rap, don't they? But mine was all right, it was fine. It was just a little sort of microcosm of society. It was good people, it was bad people like anywhere. You know, there was a few families we didn't get on with. There were some bigger boys that used to pick on me and my brothers because we weren't exactly like them. You know, we didn't have the right trainers, we didn't have a telly, we didn't have a car, we had a dad. You know, there was... Uh, <laughs> uh, it was just... We weren't always like everyone else. But it was, as you would imagine, a full-on, you know, working-class upbringing. And so I feel working-class, but my life isn't like that anymore. You know, I do this job now, and my life has changed to an unbelievable level that I could never have imagined as, uh, as a child. And when I look at my own children, my own children have only ever known a good life. They've only ever known things that I could never have dreamt of when I was their age. They go on holidays, they eat at restaurants, they get clothes first time. And it's... <laughs> It's kind of weird, and I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room right now who are also raising children that are posher than you. <laughs> yeah, it's weird, isn't it? It's weird raising children that are posher than you. Sometimes you find yourself looking at your own kids thinking, I wonder if I'd have been their friends when I was their age. <laughs> nope. So I find myself stuck in between these two, this working class upbringing, but I've got these middle class children. So I invented a term. The muddle class. And the muddle class is somewhere in the middle of the two. Let's find out in this room. Who reckons they're working class? Yeah. Who reckons they're middle class? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you're not, love. <laughs> um, I mean... Yay! Sandra, you're middle class. Come on! It's hard to define where you are, right? But actually, I think a lot of us are muddle class. Let me explain. The muddle class is somewhere in the middle, where it's the two cultures collide, where the working class and the middle class come together. And it can happen at any moment. You will realise you're middle class. It I remember when it happened to me, when I suddenly realised I was middle class. It was a couple of years ago. I remember I was sat there one morning, I was watching Jeremy Kyle eating olives. <laughs> and I thought... <laughs> Something's different about my life. <laughs> At any moment, you can spot it. Maybe next week you find yourself drinking Prosecco out of one of those massive mugs from Sports Direct. <laughs> Maybe he's onto something, this lad. But if you've ever taken a Findus Crispy pancake out of an Arga, you are muddle class, my friend. <laughs> you've been on a skiing trip using Ryanair, you are muddle class. <laughs> ever told your child to pretend he was under five so you could get into centre parks for free? <laughs> You are muddle class. Ever had a mattress on your front lawn, but it was memory foam? Muddle class. <laughs> the clincher seems to be, from my research, the clincher in this country seems to be if your child thinks getting on the bus is a treat rather than a necessity. <laughs> it's like a day out to these kids. <laughs> Can we go on the bus, Daddy? Not unless you'll get stabbed in the face, my love, no. <laughs> 
can we sit upstairs? <laughs> no, we'll sit behind the driver and the cameras. <laughs> His daddy's been on a bus before. <laughs> we'll do two stops and we're getting an Uber home. <laughs> this is not a trip. And generally, I'm fine with that. I'm fine now, I know my place in the world. Anyone, after that brief description, feel like they might also be middle class? Yeah. Yeah. I feel all right now. I find myself uh, in the very firmly in the middle class. Absolutely feel fine with my life. And it only gets difficult when I see my brother, when I speak to my brother, because my brother is very proudly working class. You know, he's a plumber, he's a white van man, and he's two up, two down with his wife and his two kids. He lives in South Manchester. And he looks down at me, if I'm honest with you, he looks down at me, because what I do, all this to him, is not a proper job, it's not a full day's work, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, he likes coming on holiday with us. <laughs> oh, it's a proper job that week, yeah. But the rest of the year, he looks down his nose at me, because this is not a full day's work, it is not a proper job, you know? And sometimes I ring him after my show, you know, or speak a few times a week. I ring him up, all right, mate, all right, mate, yeah. what have you been up to? Oh, I just done a gig, I was filming the, the show, like, oh, nice, what was that like? Yeah, it went well, great audience, great venue, Enjo enjoyed it, yeah. How's the tour going? And in that moment, I just forget that I'm not talking to somebody who loves me unconditionally. <laughs> and I'll be honest with him for a second, you know, I'll say, yeah, it's gone well, you know, I'm, I'm a bit tired now. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as the word comes out of my mouth, I can hear him seething at the other end of the phone. Oh, yeah, no, you must be knacking me, yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't know how you manage all that talking for two hours a night. You must be shattered, pal, shattered. <laughs> oh, don't worry about me, no, I've got my arm stuck with you, Ben, for 12 hours. But no, no. <laughs> you're the tired one, aren't you, of course? You're, yeah, you're the tired one. Why don't you pop round here tomorrow and make your brew, give your foot rub? You deserve it, lad, you deserve it. <laughs> Really? No, not really. Have a Barocca and a fucking word with yourself, you show me stop it! Because in our family, I don't know what yours is like, but in ours, unless you are the most tired, <laughs> you are not tired at all. <laughs> There's no second place tiredness. It's like top tired and not tired, isn't it? It's like tiredness top trumps every time you see each other. You all right? Yeah, I'm a bit tired. Well, I see you're tired, and I raise you my tired. <laughs> Comedian tired can't beat plumber tired. I'm thinking of pitching it as, like, a, a game show. I reckon this could be a good Saturday night BBC One game show called Top Tired and Not Tired. Right? <laughs> it's like your old play your cards right, but it's just with people and our attitudes to their jobs. <laughs> Do you want a quick game of Top Tired and Not Tired? It's higher or lower. So if you think someone is, uh, is going to be more tired than me, you'll shout higher. And if you think they're going to be less tired than me or the person before them, you'll shout lower. It's very, very simple. So we're going to start. We'll start with you, sir. What's your name? Lee. Lee. Hello, Lee. Where are you from? Stockport. Stockport. Lovely stuff. OK. Lee, you've done very well here because you're the first card out of the deck. You're the one after the comedian. The comedian is the lowest card, so it can only be higher. We're just doing it as a tester, really. Give us a cheer and let me know what you think. Do you think Lee's job is higher or lower than a comedian? Higher. higher. Of course it is. Lee, what do you do for a living? I'm an office manager. An office manager. <laughs> Well, this is unprecedentedly. <laughs> In 250 shows, it's never been lower than a comedian, but... <laughs> an office manager. We'll say you, we'll say you one card up, because it will we'll just be nice. OK, so one card up. <laughs> Madam, what's your name? Sandra. Sandra here. Do we think Sandra is higher or lower than an office manager? Oh, Sandra, what do you do for a living? Medical receptionist. Medical receptionist. Ooh, the doctor's gatekeeper. <laughs> Can I get an appointment? <coughs> Can I get an appointment? You shall not pass! <laughs> A good job for the nosy, in it. <laughs> Can I ask what's wrong with you? Well, I'd rather just speak to the doctor about it. You need to tell me first. 
Do I, though? Do I? OK, certainly it's going to be difficult. You're working with ill people, so we're definitely going to go higher for you, Sandra. Uh, sir, what's your name? Huey. OK, Huey, higher or lower than a medical receptionist? <laughs> higher again, we think. OK, Huey, what do you do? I manage a fire protection department. You manage a fire, fire protection department. <laughs> he's done one of them where he's made his job sound well important. <laughs> When we get to the bones of this job, he's in charge of a bucket. <laughs> I've got my bucket, lads! I'm managing this department! <laughs> <laughs> Sounds dangerous. We're going to go a little bit higher, OK? Absolutely. Sir, so what's your name? Will. 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 Higher or lower? What do we think? Higher or lower? What do you do? Work for Mercedes Benz. You work for Mercedes Benz? Ooh. What do you do for Mercedes Benz, Will? Work in the call centre. In the call centre. <laughs> <laughs> you really bigged it up, though, didn't you? Hello, Mercedes Benz. Will speaking. How can I help you? <laughs> Hiya, mate. Yeah, I've just been driving my Mercedes and it's like a ticking noise going on. I don't know what I've pressed. That's the indicator, dickhead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I might have just discovered it by accident, pal. <laughs> so a round of applause for our front row. <laughs> Sometimes I take my kids round to my brother's house. That's quite hard when I take my posh kids round to my working class brother's house. I have to line them up outside before we go in and go, right, guys, do not let me down in here, OK? Do not let me down with your ways. Yeah? <laughs> Whatever do you mean, Daddy? <laughs> Shit like that! <laughs> Why do you talk like the railway children? You're from Stockport. <laughs> let's just get in here, eat what's put in front of you, watch whatever's on the telly, do not correct anyone's grammar, and let's just get through this with our Uncle Stephen looking down his nose at Daddy. That's all I want out of life. We're doing all right for a bit. Then half an hour to dinner, one of them will pipe up. Oh, Daddy, don't like this smashed avocado. It's all warm. I'm like, it's mushy peas. Get it down your neck. <laughs> it's hard to, to, to protect your kids from everything, isn't it? You know, the news is going on. There's kids in school. I try and take all negativity out of my kids' lives. And some people in my circle of friends and family think I've gone too far. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if you think the same as them. Tell you exactly what I've done with my kids. I've recently banned my children from watching Disney cartoons. Yeah. Who loves Disney? Give us a cheer if you love Disney. Yeah. Look, I understand why you love Disney, I get it. They're beautifully made, they're gorgeously crafted, the animation is second to none, the characters, the, the nostalgia, you remember where you were, who you were with when you first watched them. They mean a lot to a lot of people. This is the reason I banned them in our house. Disney are obsessed with killing parents. <laughs> Think about it. I thought it was just the odd film here and there. No. 93% of Disney cartoons, <laughs> if the main character isn't an orphan to begin with, one or both of those parents will die, on average, about 14 minutes into that film. <laughs> and it's happening so frequently now, children are not even bothered when it happens. <laughs> We watched a film recently called The Good Dinosaur. I don't know if you've seen it, but this is what happens, right? The dad takes the son out to, to sort of learn some skills, uh, to, to sort of, you know, some life skills. And then a storm hits, a severe storm, and the river starts to rise, and the dad manages to get the son to higher ground, but his footing goes, and boom, splash, he's in the water, and the current's too strong, it takes him away. Whoosh, dad, no, son, dad, no, son, dad, dad. <laughs> Blub, 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 dead. <laughs> Cut to my living room, I'm not too proud to tell you. Me, crying my bastard eyes out, I was. <laughs> sobbing, sobbing from the soul. I turn around to my kids on the sofa, not arsed, not bothered at all. <laughs> Just sat there, eating the crudités, living their best life. <laughs> I'm devastated. Should we just pause it for a second, guys? <laughs> So just have a little think about some of the issues that this film has raised. <laughs> no, Daddy, we're fine, my daughter said. We're fine, Daddy, because he can go on his adventure properly now his dad's dead. <laughs> this is what this 
university are teaching our young ones. You can have a better adventure if your dad's dead. <laughs> Why has he got to be dead? Why couldn't he be at work or upstairs? But no, he's got to be dead. <laughs> in that film, there's no reason for the dad to be dead. Yes, he can not be in it for a while, but at the end of the film, the son, the good dinosaur, ends up back with his mum and his little brother, and it's a lovely, gorgeous family reunion. There's no reason the dad could not have also came in at the end like, hey, what about that bloody river? <laughs> I thought I was a goner there, lad. <laughs> That's actually a better ending. <laughs> I've got a theory. I've got a theory, and the theory is this. I think there's a psychopath working for the Disney Corporation. <laughs> I think he's in charge of it. I think he's maybe an old, decrepit, evil old man. Maybe a friend of old Walt himself, he's been there for generations and he has his fingers in every pie. Every film has got to come through his office so he can make notes on it. And this office is just a big oak table. All the walls and windows are stained with nicotine from his big cigar. He only ever sees bloodshot eyes light up when the embers glow. And these writers have been coming in for generations with beautiful ideas full of love and life and laughter and song and dance and family and friendship. And they come in, teams of two and three for support, papers shaking in their hand out of nerves. And they pitch their ideas. We've got a lovely idea for a film, sir. It's about a young deer and his mum. <laughs> it's set on the first day of spring and all new life is waking up. He's got a little rabbit friend called Thumper does this with his foot when he's excited. It's about all the lessons that they can teach each other. It's about friendship and family. And we really think this is going to be one of the seminal hits for the Disney Corporation. Kill a mum. What was that? <laughs> What do you mean? Like maybe like of old age or something? No, no, shoot her in the face. Yeah, shoot her in the face. <laughs> shoot her in the face on the first day of spring in front of the child. That's the sort of film. That's the sort of film we're making now. We've got a lovely idea for a film. It's about a young lion and his dad. <laughs> it's about the circle of life. Uh, and how all the creatures are uh, equal and should look after each other. We've got Elton John doing the music. It's gonna be a toe-tapping sensation, let me tell you that. This is going to be one of the most important films Disney has ever killed a dad. What? <laughs> I said, kill a dad. <laughs> what, like before the film starts? No, about 40 minutes in, so we get to like him. Yeah, do that. <laughs> hey, hey, here's a twist. Let's make it the child's fault so he always blames himself. That's a nice one, isn't it? <laughs> They've even ruined other companies. We've got a great idea for a film. We've teamed up with Pixar. Great company, they're going places. This film is about an old man and his wife. I'm going there, guys. I'm committed. <laughs> yeah, I'm bored. They've always wanted to travel. And he works with balloons. <laughs> One day, he ties thousands of balloons to the roof of his house and they float off to Paradise Falls. They have a wonderful, well-deserved adventure. We think this is going to be a wonderful film for the Disney Corporation. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Any notes on that, sir? <laughs> Husband and wife, you say? I think that's really important, actually. Um, you know, in this day and age, over 50% of marriages end in divorce, and we want to tell people, you know what, marriage is hard. You know, we can all be married on a good day. You've got to get through the tough times. And if you can get through the tough times, this film teaches you that one day, love will reward you. Love will give you back what you deserve. Kill a wife. <laughs> <laughs> that is not where I thought that was going. Kill a wife! <laughs> when? In the first two and a half minutes! <laughs> That'll ruin people's nachos! Let's have the old man crying in his house, surrounded by loving memories about to be bulldozed. We'll make this the most harrowing opening of any film since Saving Private fucking Ryan. <laughs> Sounds a bit of a downer. Call it up. <laughs> Call in the marketing. And you know, some people say to me, oh, Jay, you've just picked three films at random there to prove a point. Let me tell you right now, that is not true, because I did a list. <laughs> Belle, Beauty and the Beast, dead mum. Pocahontas, dead mum. Princess and the Frog, dead dad. Fox and the Hound, dead mum. Cinderella, both parents dead. Snow White, both parents dead. Finding Nemo, oh, God. <laughs> Bastards. <laughs> <sighs> Nobody pitched that as an idea, did they? Of course they didn't. <laughs> They pitched a nice idea. We've got a lovely idea for a film. It's about a mum and dad fish. 
all the hundreds of children. It's about all the adventures they get up to under the sea. No, 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 it sounds boring. All right, what do you want us to do? Kill a mother. <laughs> Kill a mother, massacre the children, leave a dad who does not know what he's doing and a disabled child. That's the sort of film we're going to make. <laughs> yeah, give him half a fit, sod him. Yeah, he's swimming around in circles for 90 minutes and all I care. <laughs> who is this psychopath stealing our children's childhoods? Lilo and Stitch, dead parents. Jungle Book, dead parents. Sword in the Stone, he's an orphan. Pinocchio, real dad's a tree. That doesn't really fit him with the rest of it. <laughs> it's on the shelf. Tarzan's parents were killed by a leopard. Little Mermaid, now you might not know this from the original Little Mermaid, but in the prequel, Little Mermaid 3, Ariel's Beginning, right, which I have seen, <laughs> the mum does make a very uh, brief appearance. She's in it for a little bit. There's a whole storyline where uh, the Little Mermaid, Ariel, has, has annoyed uh, some people on land. And there's a moment in the bay where she's protecting her sisters. About a dozen pirate ships come into the harbour and they're coming right at her with venom and weapons. And she's trying to protect her sisters. And last minute, the mum jumps out of the water. Boom, she, she pushes Ariel out of the way. Bang, she's hitting the head by the hull of the pirate ship. And it's a heartbreaking, harrowing moment as she's fatally wounded and she floats off into the water there. Mom! Ariel, I will always love <laughs> Oh, I guess you're right in the feels. And the director has very bravely gone for silence rather than music to lead you to an emotion. And in the calm of the water and the silent sobs of the sisters, the only noise that breaks it is the footsteps on the deck of the pirate ship as one of them leans over to assess the damage. Oh, no, we have hit the mermaid. <laughs> it comes out of nowhere! Actually correct, pirates! Touché, Disney! <laughs> I did not see that coming. <laughs> There's a long wait for that gag, wasn't it? <laughs> it was about 40 minutes ago I set that up and you did very well. To remember it better than me, actually. On the, at the beginning of the tour, I was doing a gig one night in Cambridge, and I did that bit there, thinking, oh, this will get a chuckle. I said it, nothing. Absolute <laughs> silence. And I thought, that's a bit weird. Anyway, I record all my shows, and on the way home, I was listening back to it, and I realised very quickly, I'd not done the bit in the first part. <laughs> uh, I learned a very valuable lesson that night, folks. <laughs> Without context, that bit is just racist. <laughs> I spend a lot of time comparing my childhood to my children's childhood, you know, and I'm slightly jealous of their childhood because they, you know, they've got all these things that I, I didn't get. And what I find most fascinating is how much time we now as parents spend with our kids. We actually spend the most amount of time with our children than any generation through history. And yet a lot of us feel like we don't spend enough time with our kids. It's this mad thing going on in your, in your two brains. When I was a kid, we didn't hang out with our parents. We didn't do stuff. There wasn't activities for us both to do together. Summer holidays were separate. The first day of school holidays, poof, off you go. When are we allowed back in? When the street lamps come on. <laughs> in September. <laughs> and we were all right, weren't we? We were fine. Of course we were. We just did stuff. We found railway lines and motorway bridges and <laughs> chasing girls with a bit of dog poo at the end of a stick. They were good times. <laughs> we didn't need Netflix. In fact, we weren't even allowed back in our house, our own homes. You'd try and get in in the middle of the day, your mum would have you. Who's that? It's just me, mum, I'm starving. No, no. <laughs> oh, you're either in or you're out. <laughs> you're like six years old. Six years old having to make the biggest decision of your life. At the end of the day, the opposite was true. You try and stay out for as late as possible. And I sort of feel sorry for a little bit because my kids will never experience the joy of feeling like your parents have forgot to shout you in. <laughs> you know, you get to the end of the day when you were a kid, you were looking at the moon thinking, I should be looking at that. <laughs> I'm five, I should not be seeing the moon. All the way through, 5 to 15, you would go nowhere near your house at the end of the day for fear of being called in first. <laughs> you could never lose the badge of shame being called in first for an early night in a bath. Never. <laughs> and your mum's got sonar. If you went even near her house, she'd be out the top window. Poof, you in. 
and you'd say anything to stay out. Oh, please, Mum, Paul and Jamie are still out. And she'd have the answer straight away. Well, I'm not Paul and Jamie's mum, am I? <laughs> My dad would try it. You, in. Paul and Jamie are still out. Well, I'm not Paul's dad, am I? What about Jamie? We don't talk about that. Just get the answer. <laughs> different time, then. Different time. <laughs> I'll tell you who amazed me, though. Grandparents. What a set of legends grandparents are. How they've changed their personalities. From the ultimate disciplinarian <laughs> to just jolly green giant. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Have we got any grandparents in? Yeah. yeah. There's a few of you there. The rest of them at home minding your kids, aren't they? That's what they are. <laughs> yeah, I know. And let me tell you right now, your kids are still up. <laughs> Did you ever watch your parents being grandparents and think to yourself, who are you? <laughs> Who are you and when did you become so nice? <laughs> when I was 14, I remember it clearly. Every day you were a nightmare, you know? My mum would say to me, you wait till your dad gets home. <laughs> and I'd be worried all day. Every time I saw a shadow at the door, oh, God, he's here, oh, God, he's here, oh, God, he's here. <laughs> and now I see a shadow at the door, he just comes straight in. <laughs> Granddad's here! <laughs> like, who's this guy? <laughs> Kids fly downstairs like he's the second coming. Granddad, Granddad! <laughs> he's got sweets in every pocket. Hey! <laughs> Whoop to make the sun shine. <laughs> My life feels full. Does your, does your life feel full? Mine is full to bursting, man, honestly. It's hard work. I've got five children, and I have four children with my ex-wife, and uh, I have uh, a little girl with my new wife. And it, my wife wants another baby. I know. And I, I, I'm in two minds about it, I'll be honest with you, because I feel like I'm done. You know what I mean? I'm done. Five kids is already too many kids. <laughs> but her argument is totally valid. And some of you will be in second relationships and second, third or fourth, I don't know. But, you know, sometimes your past affects somebody else's future. And she'll say things like, well, it's not fair, is it? Because you've got five kids and I've only got one. <laughs> and I say, well, have one of them. But sometimes there are more important things than being right. So I do lie awake at night thinking about the idea of having a sixth child. And every child you have changes your life in a different way. No more so than the first child. I think we can all be honest with that. From zero to one child is the biggest change in anybody's life. Financially, spiritually, physically, emotionally, socially, everything changes. And then when you have a second child, you think that will probably double in difficulty. But it doesn't, does it? It doesn't. The second child, if anything, is a bit easier because you care less. Yeah, second time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean you love less. I'm not a monster. <laughs> but you definitely care a little bit less. That first one, everything sterilised within an inch of its life. <laughs> second baby, ten second rules on a dummy. You know, just stuff like that. <laughs> Put it in your mouth. It's been in a dog's mouth. It's been in the family longer than you. Put it in your mouth. <laughs> just changes. You get more relaxed. Maybe you get better at it. I don't know. Every child changes your life in some way. Three is hard, four is hard. But five is sort of similar to four, so I can only presume that six is similar to five. The only thing that stops me, this is the only negative I have, and it's going to sound silly, but genuinely this is what I think, right? Every child you have after three children leaves you access to a slightly shitter selection of cars <laughs> <laughs> that you are able to drive. <laughs> Honestly, we're in a seven-seater at the moment, and I'm not prepared to go shitter than that. I can't do it. <laughs> Sometimes we're lying in bed at night, having a kiss and a cuddle, and I can hear, you know, feel a hand in a certain place, and I think, hang on a minute, I know what this move means. <laughs> and I join in, of course I do, but there's always that little voice in my brain giving it, Jason, what are you doing, mate? Psst, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> Look, I don't doubt that the next 30 to 40 seconds will be lovely. <laughs> but what the fuck would we drive? What would we drive? <laughs> there's nothing left, mate, you did all the Googling. You'd have to get some sort of deal with the National Express to do the school run. <laughs> You know, sometimes I drop my youngest girl at nursery, there are less children in her class than I've got in my bloody car. <laughs> That's not right, is it? I used to have a nice car. I was doing sort of 50,000 miles a year, and I thought, right, I'm going to get a lease car and just have something nice to drive around. I bought a, I got a Jaguar car on finance. Oh, my God, I loved it. 
And I loved that car. I cried in that car. I laughed in that car. I sang in that car. I ate in that car. I slept in that car. And one day, I had too many kids for the car. <laughs> and I remember going into the showroom. I said, excuse me, I'd like to speak to somebody about a, about a seven-seater car, please. The salesman came out. You're looking for a brand new car, sir? I said, what's the point, mate? <laughs> what's the point of having anything nice anymore? I just have one of them sunbleak shit wagons you keep in the yard. <laughs> and to be fair, that's what he sold me. He sold me a seven-year-old Sharan. I ate that car. <laughs> Even as I was leaving, he was like, do you want to test drive it? I said, I'd like to drive it the least amount of times. <laughs> we ate each other. It's a hateful, hurtful relationship, me and that car. And I remember I got home. And I still had the nice car for a few days before I had to go back to the finance company. And I had them both outside the house there in the driveway. The lovely Jaguar car. The shitty Sharan. <laughs> my ideal self. My core self. <laughs> that one with its chocolate walnut interior. That one. Just mostly chocolate now. <laughs> and I took a picture, because I thought it was important. I thought it was a seminal moment in my life as I was muddling through. I took a picture of those two cars together. And a few weeks later, I've got a younger brother and sister now, and there's five of us, and my little brother was sort of 17 at the time, and he was out with his girlfriend, and they were, I saw him all over Instagram, and him and his girlfriend having a lovely time, kissing and dancing and canoodling and whatever. And so I sent him a picture of those two cars together. <laughs> and I said, hiya, mate, hope you're having a lovely time with each other there. Looks lovely. Little tip for you, wear a condom. You know, lads can be obsessed with unprotected sex. For time immemorial, they have been obsessed with it, you know? They'll try and get it wherever they can. They'll, please, babe, please, babe, I love you, babe. They'll try and charge you. I love you, babe, I swear, babe. I just want to be closer to you, babe. I want to do it the natural way, babe. I swear I'll pull out. I swear, honestly. <laughs> they will try and convince you. In that moment, don't get swept away with it. In that moment, ladies, I want you to remember my face. Not my face, my words. <laughs> if you want. It's up to you. Might work as, like, a delaying tactic. I don't know. <laughs> Remember my words. Well, he's a look him in the eye and says, you know what, before we do it your way, put your pants back on. I want you to go downstairs. I want you to find channel 615 on the skybox there. That's Nickelodeon Junior to me and you, OK? <laughs> I want you to watch 28 episodes of Peppa Pig back to back. <laughs> and not different ones. No, no, no. The same one! <laughs> that one where they're fixing the fucking road for ages, that one. <laughs> and while you're watching that, I want you to feed a baby food that it liked yesterday, but hates today for no reason. <laughs> while you wander around your house, because you can smell poo, but you can't find it. <laughs> while you run to the bottom of the stairs at random intervals and just shout shoes and teeth into a random abyss of nothing. <laughs> Because no one listens to your pathetic, whiny voice anymore while you just sit on your crap couch and you cry into a cold cup of tea because you haven't had a hot one in three and a half years. <laughs> then we'll see how natural you like it, you bonehead. <laughs> show on this moment, right? Firstly, I hope you all genuinely enjoyed yourself and did forget about all the things that were worrying you for the last couple of hours. Yeah, great. I love that. I love that. That's what I want for you. Because, you know, what can happen is, with between your ideal self and your core self, and we've all got it going on, is that sometimes you can create yourself a, a cycle of failure 
where you've set yourself a target that you've not been able to achieve and then you feel worse because of it. And we've all got this going on. We all compare ourselves to other people. Social media doesn't help. You see people with their perfect kids and their perfect houses. You think, why is my house a shit tip and my kids are a nightmare? And this person looks like they've got everything sorted. They've not got everything sorted. They're just better at taking photos than you. That's the only thing. <laughs> They're just better at taking photos than you. That's the only thing that's different between you. Do not compare your full film to somebody else's trailer, OK? Because it's not the same thing at all. Right? Now... <laughs> my, my two bits that I just want to tell you very quickly is this. Firstly, your problems are the worst problems in the world. Whatever you are going through individually, that is the worst problem in the world to you. Yes, we're not told to think like that. We always think, yeah, well, you shouldn't feel like that because that person's doing that and that person's just lost the bum and that person's just lost the job and whatever it is, and they should feel worse than you. They probably do, but you can only feel your own problems. You know, you can empathise with them, but you can only feel your own. And I get it sometimes. I feel sad, I feel anxious, I feel depressed because I've got all these wonderful things going on in my life and then sometimes I feel sad and then I feel bad that I feel sad about my what looks like a perfect life, you know? And it's like when you were a kid and you told your mum you were hungry and she said, well, there's kids on the news. <laughs> and they're starving. <laughs> it was true, but it didn't fill you up, did it? You were like, oh, <laughs> well, that's quenched me hunger, that fact. <laughs> when it comes to men, I don't... I, 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 this is for everybody, but specifically men, you know, under 55, the biggest killer in men is, is suicide from depression. More than anything else right and the reason I mention it is because I know as a bloke under 55 I know what it's like you know we don't always talk about things we bury things we maybe we've got lads that we have a, a pint with or a, play a bit of five a side with or whatever it is and we, we might not feel like we can necessarily talk to them about what's going on in, in here you know and I would say Definitely do that, definitely talk. Even if you need to go and see the doctor and have a chat to the doctor about it, you go for other things, don't you? You let him have a little hold of your bollocks and put a finger up your ass. but for some reason, <laughs> we won't go for a chat, which, if anything, seems less weird. <laughs> the biggest bit of advice anyone gave me, and I, I just want to pass this on to every single person watching this show, and it's this. Just because you are struggling, it doesn't mean you're failing. And everything is in a cycle and you will get through it, okay? So just because you're struggling doesn't mean you're failing. And I think, you know what, if I can say that to a room full of people that I just met tonight, well, you can say it to one of your mates or your wife or your husband or the doctor the next time you feel like you need to get something off your chest. Okay. You're not alone, folks.